All right, the Paz brothers are back with an NFL-themed edition of the podcast. Bobby, the Final Four is set in the NFL. The uh, championship weekend, we've got Kansas City going to Baltimore in the early game next Sunday. And then in the nightcap, Detroit just continues this magic carpet ride going into San Francisco. Uh, Final Four weekend. A quick question before we get into our thoughts on the game and some other things that we want to break down and talk about. I was thinking about this. Does the NFL have the best Final Four in any sport? Now, I know the knee-jerk reaction is just to go, well, it's college basketball, right? I mean, it's, you know, the whole season. They call the season the road to the Final Four. It's the only sport I can think of where you would hang a banner for getting to the semifinals. But March Madness, to me, a lot of times, it sort of peaks that first week, right? You got all these games going on. You got buzzer beaters. You got the, the 12 beating the five. You got all that fun stuff. And then you get to the final four, and no disrespect to the great people at FAU and San Diego State, but I don't, I don't want to see that at the end. I want the Blue Bloods. But with the NFL, you're pretty much guaranteed good matchups. I mean, all these teams that make it can win. You got the one seeds getting the bye. So what are your thoughts on the best final four in all of sports? Well, any, any sport that doesn't have a one-game playoff is immediately eliminated. It just takes too long, right? Baseball and basketball, that just takes – it takes too long. Soccer, no one cares, so that's eliminated immediately. Hockey is more than a one game. So in the major sports, I think you're right. It comes down to those two sports. And for the shock of the listeners, I agree with you. It's not college basketball. The, the, and I'm, I'm a college basketball guy. I love it. I watch it. But by the time it hits the Final Four, oftentimes it's pretty anticlimactic. And how dare you, how dare you say bad things about Dusty May and the FAU Owls. We love Dusty May and the FAU Owls, but oftentimes teams get in there, you don't want it. So it is football. Anytime you come on, is this the greatest? If football's in the contest, it's probably going to win because it is the most popular sport. And there's just no chance I'm missing these games. There's a chance I would miss a Final Four game, but there's no chance I'm missing these games. Sure, and for our listeners, I mean, I know who Dusty May is, but Dusty May again? Who is that? Dusty May is the head coach of FAU. Naturally. He naturally head coach of FAU um, is probably going to get the next big job. He's kept FAU. Um, and I know of a retired basketball coach, semi-retired basketball coach in the Jupiter area, which is right by FAU, who would be an incredible hire. So Dusty May at Dusty May at Coach McCall. Give him a call. Coach, give him a call. Coach McCall, he'll be coming to the podcast at some point. We'll have to, we'll have to get him on. Or we got some, we got some good data. He'll probably show up uh, in the March time frame when we start breaking around said bracket. On he's the already, he's podcast. already committed. I've already, did I tell you that uh, he's already committed? He's in. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Can't he's wait booked. to get, uh, can't wait to get Coach McCall on that. All right, so look, we had uh, uh, you know two two games each day. We'll kind of go through each one, just some of our thoughts uh, on that. Kind of keep a lighter tone. I mean, we started off. The first game on Sunday, and I just had written down, Lamar finally delivers. Look, I don't think there was a guy who had more pressure on him this past weekend than Lamar. He had to win this game. His playoff results were not good. The first half started off, and I was like, whoa, this is not off to a great start. Is C.J. Stroud going to all of a sudden crown himself as the next guy? But then they poured it on. He looked fantastic. Maybe they got over the jitters of that and got over the rust of being off for a week. They, to me, when they put it all together, look like the best team. Now, whether or not they can put it all together, I don't know. But I thought that was huge for Lamar in that win over Houston. How about you? Yeah, same thing. The the And what we have to rec, uh, remind the listeners of is well, I don't know what a 3-4 defense technically is. I don't know what a zero coverage is. I don't necessarily know what a tackle is supposed to do on a run. So we're going to commentate on these games just like we all watch them. We think we know football, but we really don't. But we all know what our eyes saw. And Lamar and Baltimore, I think, I are by far and away the best team that's left. Um, and good for Lamar. Good for Lamar. It was kind – his contract negotiations in the offseason, I don't know why they kind of annoyed me. They just kind of did. I don't think there was ever any jeopardy of him leaving um, Baltimore – He's he's obviously worth the money. He's going to win his second MVP, but I'm I'm over those negotiations. And he's just he's he's incredible uh, when you compare him to some of these these quarterbacks that have starting jobs in the NFL. 
along with some other guys we're going to talk about, they're in a class of their own. And how about our guy, C.J. Stroud? I feel like we've been on him. We've been fans of his, just kind of talking up his praises as clearly a guy you'd want to buy a lot of stock of right now moving forward. I mean, the Houston Texans went from almost the first pick in last year's draft to now having an unbelievably bright future in that division, which is poor, and then in that conference moving forward. He was he was outstanding. Look, eventually it was gonna, you're going to kind of run out of steam as a rookie going on the road against probably the best team in the NFL. But what are your lasting thoughts on Stroud? Well, the fact he kept it, it kept it halfway close to that first quarter and a half was amazing because that Baltimore defense was fired up, man. They were, I mean, that place was loud. They were getting after him. But it kind of made me think, and this has been talked about a little bit, is he the best rookie quarterback of all time? And so like our friend Will Hunting, there's, there's no perfect way to look at this. So I just kind of looked at the numbers and you tell me if I missed any categories. So what I did was, I kind of took the 10 or 12 best rookie seasons that are kind of agreed upon by folks. And I looked at these categories, number of wins. Give me a yay or nay number. Is that important? Number of wins. Oh yeah. Winning percentage. Sure. Did you make the playoffs? Of course. Did you win a game in the playoffs? Big. Touchdowns. Sure. Interceptions. Yards. Number of completions completion percentage and rushing yards. Okay. I miss any are those, I mean, now, yeah, I mean, look, I, the, the, the stats, look, the stats are all inflated now. Probably if you compare those to, you know, some of the older guys, I guess if you were to look at is probably way inflated, but yeah, I think you've hit the major categories. I mean, of those that I wrote down, you know, winning, what's your winning percentage, you know, getting to the playoffs and then winning a playoff game as a rookie, I would value that really high. Yeah, and so I, I, I'm going to list off the 10 or 12 that we looked at, but I just, where this is a flawed system is I would I would probably say a winning percentage is much more valued than number of completions. In this grading, I just give it the same exact value, which is flawed, but it is what it is. Also, Mark Sanchez in his rookie year took the Jets to the AFC Championship. He's not even on my list of greatest ones because his stats weren't great. So it's flawed, but we got... Peyton Manning in 98, Jameis Winston in 15, Andrew Luck in 12, Russell Wilson in 12, RG3 in 12, Big Ben in 04, CJ Stroud in 23, Marino in 83, Cam in 11, Baker in 18, Justin Herbert in 20, and Dak in 2016. So Marino's rookie was 83, not 80. For some reason, I had him right. as a rookie in 84. So he played in 83. That's right. He's he at 83. Nine, he played nine, nine games. games. So his number of wins was seven, which is actually pretty good. So again, kind of flood. Here's the other thing. Jordan Love is not on this list because he's not a rookie, but he's a rookie. You know, yeah. I mean, but we couldn't count him. So um, the top five. So obviously, in the num- the lowest number of interceptions gets the highest, gets, a, gets one point right? Highest number of TDs gets one point, lowest score wins. The fifth best season using these stats is Andrew Luck in 12. Um, You know, he won 11 games, got him to the playoffs. Justin Herbert in 20. Um, That's pretty impressive seeing as how he's the only one of these top five that didn't go to the playoffs. That's how good his stats were. Uh, Russell Wilson in 12. C.J. Stroud in 23 is technically the second best. And number one, which will bleed into some of these conversations we'll have, is just, you just kind of like a, uh, Dak Prescott, Dak Prescott, 2016. (laughs) Oh, that's perfect. He wasn't particularly close. He was 13 and three, made the playoffs, 23 touchdowns, four interceptions, 3,600 yards, 282 rushing yards, 67.8% completion percentage. I mean, it's really, really impressive. But like his his entire career and his franchise, you're just like, eh, eh, whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting list. It's kind of, look, I remember Luck, you know, that's what they notably got rid of Peyton Manning because uh, he was hurt that year. So they were terrible. They get the number one pick. They go with Luck. He was probably the last sure thing now i know he retired early but luck was really good he just got beat up playing with that team he was really good 
Herbert, you know, for whatever reason, people love that guy. I'm just not sure he's the guy. I think to your point, a lot of numbers, not a whole lot of playoffs. Would you trade, would you trade both of the Bears' first-round picks this year for Justin Herbert? No. Give me something else. Uh, Russell Wilson, I guess he's a Hall of Famer maybe. I mean, it's kind of ending badly, but the guy was a yard away from two Super Bowls. The Dak thing is – it's it's hilarious. At that. I, I hope you – uh, re-engineered the numbers to make it Dak come out. That's probably a better story. But yeah, CJ Stroud coming in second. I believe it. My eyes tell me that that guy is the real deal and the numbers back it up. Yeah, he's he's really, really good. And it's probably, if we look at, you know, the I don't know if we're going to this yet, but the, num- the number one story for me so far out of this playoffs is we might have discovered two more dudes. Jordan Love and CJ Stroud are dudes. They look like the dudes. Um, people love them. They're winning games. It's uh, uh, that's that's what I'm taking out of this playoff so far. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good segue into the into the second game. Uh, this was Saturday night. This was uh, Green Bay at the Niners. I was expecting the Niners, quite honestly, just to roll right over the Packers. The Packers have gotten better. They looked unbelievable against the Cowboys. But kind of to your point, I mean, did we expect the Cowboys to win? But my lasting notes that I had about that game was: Are we sure about Purdy? I mean, a couple of weeks ago on this very pod, we ranked our confidence rankings in the quarterbacks. We both had Brock Purdy number one in the NFC. He's still alive, by the way. He's playing the Super Bowl. He is still alive. I think you even compared him possibly to Tom Brady. I don't know if I compared him to Tom Brady. I don't know if I did that. I I wondered if we're watching the beginning stages of the next Tom Brady, now that I say that, yeah, I was comparing him to Tom Brady. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can definitively say we are not watching the next Tom Brady. He just looks it was... like it's the eye test. He just looks like a boy. When you watch Josh Allen, Josh Allen is a man. And we'll talk about him. And Brock Purdy is a boy. Now he looks, he's just a small, yeah, the, the luster has, <laughs> their team is good. Sorry, sorry. It looked terrible. Um, I had, he was awful. I mean, he, apparently he can't hold a ball in the rain. I was notified by <laughs> Greg Olson during this. He plays in San Francisco. It's just, it's wet out there. It's cold. It's damp. It's moist. If it rains this Sunday, Detroit will kill them. It's just, it was so, I was so shocked how bad it was. Debo went hurt and the offense just didn't look the same. It's amazing how thin this line is. But maybe even as, oh, my gosh, Brock Purdy, we've got a problem. Sadly, the Packers got another guy. I just it's I just can't deal with this for another 10 or 15 years. Jordan Love looked amazing. I've got to give Matt LaFleur a ton of credit. He is this guy looks great. The Packers were by far the better team Saturday night. And Love was by far the better quarterback. I don't really know how the Niners won. Now, maybe this is the, the, the wake-up that they need to get going. But that was that was a shocking result to me. You? I saw Jordan Love walking into the stadium. You know how they show him when they're dressed? And I don't know if they on purpose put like a, a very short person next to him. But he looked like he was 11 feet tall. He, I was like, golly, this guy looks amazing. Yeah, he, they're, they are two, they're two dudes. There's no doubt about it. They're two dudes. Yeah. So great, great job by that. Look, I mean, again, kind of how we talk about you'd buy a lot of stock on C.J. Stroud and the Texans. I think you're doing the same with Love and the Packers. I mean, they look like they are. They're, I think, the youngest team I had ever heard that had ever made it that far in the playoffs. So they're young. I don't know what, like you said, Love is not a, a rookie, but that was his rookie year. I don't know how long he's been there. I mean, do they have to pay this guy now? That might be the one downside. That that dude made himself a lot of money this year and in those playoffs, so that could potentially hurt him. Uh, we move into Sunday, and I just got Goff, Lions. What a story. Dan Campbell, that crowd. Look, we're Bears fans. The Lions have had a, a, a rough, rough run. You know, we talked about it. it was the first time in history anyone had ever texted that the Detroit Lions had won a playoff game. Last week, that that's a long time. The energy in that building was incredible. I felt happy for those fans to just get to kind of experience that. And look, that was a fun game. You know, Baker is just, you know, if he'd have won, I think that would have been a cool story. I like that guy. But I just think the Golf Lions, Dan Campbell story is is a fun one. They're kind of America's team. They'll be, they'll be, everybody be rude for them, unless you're a Niners fan. 
Yeah, no doubt. I, one of my good buddies, he'll, he, he's asked to be on the podcast on the movie side of the podcast. Ian McDonald sent me a book uh, called die with zero. And it's just basically a book um, that puts into perspective. Life is about experiences. You can't take everything with you, blah, 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 uh, not blah, blah, blah. It's actually a kind of a life changing book. Um, I watched that lions game and I said, Mark, we should have just went to that game. I, I watched, I was like, can you imagine what that building was like? It just, you talk about an experience, put on the Barry Sanders jersey and go there and just be part of the crowd. I think it would be awesome. Uh, a little foreshadowing here. We were texting. If the Bills and Lions made the Super Bowl, I would have went to that Super Bowl in Las Vegas. <laughs> that would be the most amazing game ever. That would be, um, yeah. that would be a good one. It was cool. And, and as we finish up the Chiefs game, I'll give you my thoughts on Dan Campbell and some of the actors in these games. But yeah, it was okay. cool. Very cool. Yeah, one one last thing on the Lions. There's two guys, um, you know them both, I play golf with. And uh, one, Shorky, is just just high on it. He believes. Oh, he yeah, just texted, right. He texted after the game. He said, Vegas bound. You know, he's he's been all in from the start. The other guy, Furman, he's just waiting for the shoe to drop. They're going to lose. This is not what the Lions do. You know, so he's I think he's probably he's a Detroit both guy? sides. What's that? He's, he's a Detroit guy? Yeah. Both from, oh, I don't uh, think I both, that. both from Michigan. So this is, it's fun for them. Look, I like these stories. You know, I think, look, we got a lot of love in uh, 16 when the Cubbies finally did it. I mean, everybody was just like, oh, just pulling for the Cubs just to kind of see it. I think the Lions will get a little bit of that love. So it's fun to, fun to see and good stuff by them. In the finale, Mahomes is still the guy. I mean, look, we did our confidence. Here's another. Here's one we were right. I guess both guys we had. We had Mahomes. Mahomes won. We had Purdy won. They're both where alive. Did I, and I where think, did you have Flacco in that? I forgot. I, I, where did you I have don't Flacco? remember. I think it's been since deleted. I missed on Flacco. Okay. That was okay. not. That was not good by me. But I did have Golf number two. So I think yes, I got to win there. Yes, you so, did. So, but look, we both said the Chiefs were struggling. They weren't having a great year. They got no receivers. Kelsey's getting old all of a sudden. But we both said, would it shock? anyone if you lift your head up in a month and they're sitting there in the Super Bowl and unequivocally the answer is it's not shocking anybody that was a great game to your point Buffalo the stadium was electric it was on fire it was like if we're ever going to do it it's going to be now the Chiefs well, Mahomes had never played a playoff game on the road I found that amazing and the Hard whole time that game is going on it reminded me of I don't want to compare him to Jordan but it was just like he's he's just not losing this no. game. He looked so calm and confident. Every player on both sides knew Mahomes was winning. Everyone in that stadium knew that Mahomes was winning. He is still the guy, hands down. It's not uh it's not up for debate. He's still he's still the best. What I took from that game was one that the other one I was texting you just how awesome is Josh Allen. Um I love that dude. I would trade everything for that dude. Now he's only probably got two or three years left from the, what he does to his body, but he is, he is a man, but about Mahomes, and you wonder, you know, it's, just, this is why sports psychologists get paid a lot to figure this stuff out. Um, why is Mahomes this good? Like, how does this happen? Is it chicken? Is it the egg? How does this happen? You know, people start to become the stories they tell themselves as we get, taught or as we try to set, give these lessons to people we mentor or kids, you know, we become the stories that we tell us and Mahomes, for whatever reason has told himself that he's the greatest quarterback on earth and they're going to win. And Josh Allen is probably telling himself like, Hey, I've got to throw this ball. Then I've got to run and catch it. Then I got to block for myself. Then I've got to call the plays. Then I've got to play defense. Then I got to hold the kick and I got to kick the kick. He believes he's got to do everything. There was no sliding. He was shoulder down making throws that I've never, I mean, that guy threw the ball 73 yards. I looked at it, it, it. The arm strength is incredible. That touchdown pass as he's rolling to his left, to the front left corner of the end zone is like the greatest throw I've ever seen that nobody will, will never talk about it again. Cause they didn't win. You know, Dak Prescott, the story that he's, I know we didn't talk a lot about the Cowboys, but the story that he undoubtedly is telling himself that they can't come through. Now he won't, he'll never admit to that, but, as soon as they were down seven zip, the entire planet knew they weren't going to win. And that's a powerful, powerful thing, both 
you know, Dan Campbell, there are a lot of guys that got up there and said they're going to beat the Gators and we're going to sing Rocky Top all day long and nobody believes him. But Dan Campbell, they were just going to be tougher than everybody else. And somehow he got those guys to tell themselves that story. And Mahomes wasn't, I mean, he was recruited enough to play high major division one football. He was good enough to get drafted. But if we knew what he was now, he'd be drafted number one. How does Mahomes get this good? It's a very, very fun and interesting to watch. And I'd be very, very hard pressed not to pre not to bet uh, with them going into Baltimore, even though they're the underdogs and Baltimore, I think is the far superior team. Yeah, that'll be a fun one to watch. It's yeah, you know, who knows why that happens. Look, it's a combination of great athletic ability. There's there's no doubt Mahomes is a great athlete, works hard. I mean, we'll never I mean, look, that quarterback show last year that was on Netflix, you kind of got to see a little bit behind it, his belief in him and how hard he works and how hurt he was, uh, and the guys around him really like it's one of those perfect deals, like him getting Andy Reid to coach him works. It's like Brady going with Belichick, it's Montana going with Walsh. I just think there's sometimes these things just sort of happen. McMahon and you're right, there's a belief Ditka. system. McMahon Ditka. Yeah, I mean they're just guys like the punky QB. It, things are just uh things are just meant to be. There was a point it it was interesting because we texted each other like so first of all, the fumble out of the end zone, we've, we've got to talk more about that situation. The Chiefs are basically going to ice the game. It's first and goal on the one-yard line or whatever. I mean, of all people to give the ball to, this Hardman guy, I mean, that was that was just probably getting a little too cute for themselves. Just give it to Pacheco and let him run like a maniac up in there and score. But he fumbles the ball out of the end zone, and the Bills get the ball. It's got to be one of the dumbest rules in sports. But even then... I never doubted for a second that Mahomes was going to win. Where do you stand on in f the football rule of fumble? The offense fumbles the ball out of the end zone that not only do they just lose possession for some reason, the other team gets possession and they just magically get the ball in the 20. Is that the dumbest rule in all of sports? Well, it's interesting you say that because I did a little bit of research. Now, <laughs> I was sitting there and I saw across the TV that Pat McAfee is talking about the same thing. So I don't know if you're leaking – I don't know if we've got a leak. I don't know how he's getting this information that we were going to talk about this. So little loose lips sink ships. So let's keep our ideas to ourselves. Now, obviously, everybody thinks this is a dumb rule. The reason why we're talking about it. Um, it makes absolutely no sense. The punishment doesn't fit the crime. Nobody can understand it or explain it to me. But it got me thinking, what are the dumbest rules in sports? So that's up there. That is is up there. Here's another terrible rule in sports. So I know, so you know the sport of basketball. You don't love it, but you know it, right? I know so it. So the point guard, the point guard's bringing it up. He comes off a screen at the top of the key. He gets himself into the lane. He draws two. He kicks it to the wing. And you've got name your shooter out there. And the shooter lets it fly. It's beautiful. Everybody's watching it. And it gets stuck right between the rim and the backboard. The visual of it is so jarring. It's yeah. like there's a glitch in the matrix when that cat goes across because the whole world stops. This ball is used to being bounce off rim, bounce off backboard, bounce off the floor, and it just stops immediately. It just yeah. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. Uh, and what happens? They jump ball it. It's so stupid. Why would they do that? Obviously, my idea, because we got to have a solution for this, my idea is that as soon as you do that, you're out for two minutes. Now, it's not like hockey where it's a five on four now because that's gimmicky. But I want to see the guy shoot it, him hang his head, and walk right to the bench and sit there for two minutes. That's what I want. And obviously, it's the other team's ball. They, they don't get a chance. Obviously. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. What 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 do we do? What's great about that hat now? It's not so much in the NBA because guys are gigantic, college too. But in high school or even <laughs> younger ball, you've got a real problem now, right? You've got to get the ball. It's not the yeah. easiest thing. It's like there's yeah. there's sticks going on. Yeah. You're throwing yeah. balls at it. You get a cheerleaders on top of each other trying to get up there. And it's yeah, it's no, it is jarring no, when it happens. No one knows what to do. Everybody knows it's a it's a jump, but everybody's just looking around. I have no idea how it happens. So in college, it's just a possession arrow deal. It's just possession. Yeah, you like can you can literally ball. just get the ball back, not just even having ball. to jump for it. Yeah, yeah, that's 
that 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 that's a bad one. So you you, br- you brought up. I like that you have a solution, right? Because look, it's easy to complain. So yeah. So back to the fumble out of the end zone. I mean, I guess I got it. Like the solution to me is like it is everywhere else on the field. If no one recovers it, it just comes back to where the fumble occurred, right? And just put the a ball down easy, here on the end zone. Very easy solution. It's an incredibly easy solution. And what's funny is every rule in football is designed to help the offense score. Don't we want dudes going? No, just laying out at the just yes. to break that plane, yes. throwing the ball at the pylon. That's what we want. Not this. I mean, I think it, what it's going to take is somebody losing a playoff game or a Super Bowl at the at the end. You know, thirty seconds left. Oh, he fumbles the ball out of the end zone. They're out no. of timeouts. The other team gets it. We just take a couple of knees at the twenty. That's yes. it's just it's just egregious. Can I give you one? Near I got, near I got a couple more, but yeah, go ahead. I got a couple I mean, more. Yeah, get, go. Look, we love golf. We play golf. All right, so look, you just rip a drive down the middle of the fairway. I mean, just you've, you've done everything correct. We're not talking about hitting it into the woods, into the rough, into the bunker, bad lies, seriously, this is how it ends, all that kind of stuff. I hit a drive right down the middle of the fairway. It happens to roll into a divot. All right, now I'm stuck with this lie. It's just, it's sitting Makes in a sense. hole. Maybe the guy has just gotten mad in the middle of the fairway. Right. He's taking a big chunk, laid, and now I'm... I can't even move the ball out of it. I'm really disadvantaged. How is that not ground? We have a thing in golf, ground under repair. Is there a piece of ground under more repair than a divot? The fact that this doesn't happen on the PGA Tour where these guys hit the ball the same distance to the same spot to the same place in the middle of the fairway is almost a remarkable story that this doesn't happen. But we've got to Look, it's just free relief. The, the Sony Open... Two weeks ago, Bob, I don't know if you saw this. There's a playoff. This dude rips one over the 18th green. They don't even find the ball. The people in the grandstand say, yeah, we heard it rattling around over here. Our boy gets a drop three feet from the hole. Uh, Not from the hole. From the green, naturally chips it up, makes part. Now, he doesn't win, thankfully, but we can't get a drop out of a divot? This is ridiculous. It's a great one. It's so stupid, but because you're right, there's no severity. There's no, there's no grievance for, or there's no leeway for severity. You're right. People listen, I, at a very old age, uh, took a chunk out of a green on number 17 at white Combs country club with my father-in-law in the foursome. Um, yeah. So it was, uh, it was, you know, I, I, I had some issues there. Um, but, um, when the ball goes in, to a divot, you have to get relief. There is no, there's no reason not to easy get it. fix. Easy fix. What else you got? That was, I got that, was year, that was years ago, by the way. For, for those of you, that was years ago. Um, so in hockey, here's a great. This is a more comical. This is why hockey players are great. So there are major and minor penalties. Okay, a major penalty is you just did something to me. The ref didn't see it. I take my stick and I just beat you over the head with it. Right? That's a major penalty. It's five sure. minutes. There are minor penalties for tripping, for high sticking. Mark, I don't know if you know this, but if I high stick, I'm trying to pick it out, and I, I put my stick up here and I hit you in the head, it's a minor. It's an accident. It's two minutes in the penalty box. If there's any blood, it's four minutes. <laughs> blood? Any amount of blood. So I could trip you, you could fall, you could implode your orbital bone and there's no blood, it's two minutes. If I nick you with my hangnail on your cheek and there's blood, four minutes. This is an actual rule in hockey. This is I feel like those guys are bleeding all the time. Mark, it's a hundred percent a rule. It's minor. And then if there's blood, it's four minutes. Minor, two minutes, blood, four minutes. There is no amount of blood. It could be an ounce. I mean, I don't know how much an ounce of blood is. It might as well be a gallon. Uh, any blood at all. Four minutes. That's fantastic. Blood. Who knew? I've got one in hockey as well. I guess it's hockey and soccer. I don't just. I don't know if it's a dumb rule. I just can't. I don't know when someone's offsides and when someone's not. Can we just get rid of that? Why? There's no offsides in 
basketball is there it's a, I mean, it's, theoretically it's a, it's a bad example i sat and we, if you sit with somebody who watches and knows hockey they know offsides five minutes before it happens he was like ah, it's gonna be offside so it's just so me i'm just yeah, the only guy i don't know just, what offsides is yeah, All you right. just don't know you just don't I'll know. strike it from the record can i go again since that was a bad one you get struck uh, from the record we got an edit button i love how you got nervous because i said i took a chunk out of a lake I, it was a long time ago i repaired it <laughs> it's a long time ago <laughs> Okay, I'll strike that from the record. I've got one. I don't know if this is a dumb rule or just it's funny. Professional baseball. Our managers are wearing uniforms out there. I mean, this is this is terrific. I mean, could you imagine your guy, Mike McDaniel, just suiting up with the pads, just roaming the sidelines, the, maybe even the helmet, and he's just kind of like he's just on the sideline, but he's got the he's got like the headphones and the thing coming around there. He's just, he's, he's Pat. Why are these guys who are all 75 or older in the uniform? I mean, why, why are we doing that? It's I'm, 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 I'm shocked. We did our research separately and that was my last one. I love it. <laughs> now COVID <laughs> solved all this, like all these coaches in the NBA and college basketball, they solve this. They realize they don't yeah, need yeah. to do that. They just, you know, normal uh, get up. But those managers still got to put on those pants. Those pants. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good one. Now, they've gotten rid of wearing the jerseys. They just put, you know, whatever over top. But, yeah, it's yeah. a good one. It's a very good one. Now, what do you got? No, that was my last one. Oh, I, I got so just, a, just a couple of minor. College football, I hate the fact that they're down without contact. I mean, look – snap goes over the guy's head. He runs, he's got to get it. He falls down. There's not anybody 30 yards with him, And that's where you get the ball. Just seems like, can we, just, can we look, put a hand on a guy. I mean, I realized that was a, a safety thing. They don't want guys like spearing dudes when they're on the ground, but college football. I mean, that's just, that's a tough, tough rule for that. My final one, Bob would just be soccer. We've got no clock. The clock runs out and it's just, well, we're in injury time. We don't really know when this thing is going to end. Thankfully I don't watch a ton of soccer, but I'm not, I'm not huge on that. So that's good. It was fun to look at some of these just absurd rules that exist. But I think, are we in agreement? The dumbest one is the fumble through the end zone. You lo- just arbitrarily lose possession of the ball. It just has such, it has such an effect on the game um, that they've got to get, they've got to get rid of it. They got to do something about it. <laughs> it's brutal. All right. Least shocking, most shocking. We touched on this a little bit, Bob, but just kind of, if you were to run through it real quick, what was the least shocking thing you saw in the NFL this weekend. Uh, let's just start there. What was the least shocking thing? Mahomes winning. Agreed. It was very, yeah. very, very anticlimactic. Um, knew it was going to happen. Saw it coming from a mile away. Um, Mahomes winning was the least shocking thing that happened in the playoffs so far. We agree on that. We'll be the, we'll be the least shocked if they win again next week. How about the most shocking result? I think it's C.J. Stroud and Jordan Love. Hate to be repetitive here, but I think that's the most shocking thing that I saw, that how guys can be ready so fast and perform so well and other guys are so far away. Um, that's, the, that's the most shocking thing that I saw. Agreed. Yeah, the most shocking to me is similar in that vein. It's just to me that the Packers and Jordan Love were just far superior to the 49ers and Brock Purdy. I was shocked watching it. I'm somewhat shocked the 49ers won the game. Now, going into it, I probably would have said the least shocking thing I could see this weekend would be the 49ers winning. I thought they were the hands-down lock, you know, stone-cold lead pipe lock of the week kind of thing. But after watching the game, I was shocked the 49ers won. I'm still not really sure how they how they did win it. It was, it was, it was bizarre. Um, all right. We've done quarterback and coach confidence rankings bob so we've done that we put that to bed we were unbelievably successful in that venture yes but now we're going to look at which quarterback coach combo needs the super bowl the most right we've got four of them left and look wins and losses and championships they go on the quarterback and the coach's resume we did mount rushmore uh, last week on the pod talking about coaches, you know, particularly the NFL because of Belichick who appears to be coming to Atlanta now. So he's not really retired, but there were some coaches like Marv Levy that we didn't even talk about. Why didn't win a Super Bowl? went to four straight. Think of how hard that is to go to four straight, but he doesn't win one. So ultimately you can't really count them on the Mount Rushmore. Dan Marino, maybe technically the best thrower of a football, whoever lived, 
but the guy never won one. So he just gets left out of these things. So it's just a matter of how important this is to these coaches and these quarterbacks. And what's interesting here, I'll be interested to see what your take on this is, because look, there's two ways you could go with Mahomes and Reed, right? You could say, look, these guys are first ballot Hall of Famers, no matter what happens or not the rest of the way. They've kind of established themselves into another stratosphere by winning a game on the road. So maybe you say, well, they don't really need another Super Bowl. Or you take it to the aspect of, look, if Reed wants to be on the Mount Rushmore at some point, you know, like he's going to win a lot of games. He, he'll probably pass Belichick on the wins list. He's going to need a third one, right? You got you got to get there. And if Mahomes wants to be considered on the short list, once you start getting to three and four Super Bowl wins, you're starting getting into rarefied air. So I think it's an interesting look at what quarterback coach combo do you think needs the Super Bowl the most? All right, so let's start with who you think needs it. Look, they all need it. So we're, we're doing this with a grain of salt here. But who do you think needs it the least and why? I think it's Stan Campbell and Jared Goff. I think they're playing with house money. I know they'll tell us different. Goff has proved all of his critics wrong. Dan Campbell will get an extension. The press conference that he started with is long gone. That city of Detroit, they'll never pay for another meal their entire lives. It's hard for them. For, it's hard for me not to say that they're not on house money. Totally agree with everything you said. They were my least, and I think for all of those reasons, Goff's proven himself. They're not supposed to win. If they win, it's a great story. Totally agree. All right, second least. It's Lamar and Harbaugh strictly for the fact that I just don't really care. <laughs> there, I don't. I don't. There's no real storyline there. They're kind of boring. Um, Lamar's the MVP. That's great. Um, but yeah, they're just my least interesting team. I just don't really care about them that much. Okay. I just have one different, this, I struggled with the Mahomes and Reed thing, uh, to be honest with you. I put Mahomes and Reed here kind of for some of the reasons that I outlined in the beginning. They're both first ballot hall of famers. They've kind of overachieved. I would say this year, winning that game on the road was kind of like, okay, yeah, these guys, we're, we're not forgetting about them. I think they're going to retool this offense in the offseason. I mean, they just – Mahomes has got no weapons. What's going to happen with Kelsey? You, you know, I, look, does he need it for legacy and all those sorts of things? Sure, but I think he's still got a few years on the runway. So maybe we flip these two, but I go Holmes and Reed as kind of the second needing it the least. All right, second most who needs it, Bob? Where are you going? I had Mahomes and, I had Mahomes and Reed. I think it's still really, really important. Um, I think the Mount Rushmore conversation is there. You know, um, I don't know if anybody's ever going to check catch seven rings with Brady, but now Mahomes starting to get really close. Reed, you forget he's old. He's not in the greatest shape, so I don't know how long, how much longer he can do this. Um, but I would say this would be really, really important to cement the legacy. They don't need it. Their legacy is good, but now they're getting into the super, to, you know, to the upper crust of all these levels if they win yeah. another one. Agreed. Cement is the right word. Yeah, you're just you go from two to three, man. That that starts getting pretty thin. Guys that have done that. So agree with you on that. So we had Lamar and Harbaugh flip flopped. I, look, Lamar had to get kind of the monkey off his back here and, and and win this game. It's be interesting to see what happens here. Harbaugh has won one, so he's sort of proven that he can done it. I mean, we're kind of going into the month of. Har I mean, if the Harbaughs pull this off, the, the daily double. That'd be cool. I mean, you know, we're, we'll have to get Hawk back on and make sure make sure he's okay. Uh, and to shock of no one, I guess we're going to agree on the, the the last one that Purdy and Shanahan need it the most. But why are your reasons? It's probably the same, but why do they need this the most? Well, partly because how poor they looked versus the Packers. You know, you start to think, you know, Shanahan is the cool – Flat, and I love his flat, you know, he's got a flat bill. So, you know, I love him. That's your guy. Um, he's got all the shiny tools, but now there's starting to be some, some questions. Um, now there's starting to be some questions around, okay, is it just elite talent that is winning you 11, 12, 13 games, whatever they want. Now, when it comes to playoff football, all right, Shanahan, you know, McVay's got one. LaFleur is like the up and comer, you know, you're part of the flat bill crew. You got to get this thing done here. And then the, the shine has come off of, of Purdy a little bit. I'm just shocked how small he looked. It was just very strange. So I think they've got to prove that they are here. Now they're lucky they got a home game. 
Um, I don't know how big of a home field advantage it is, uh, but if they went to Detroit, I would have to think Detroit would be favored at this point. Um, I'm just not, especially if Debo doesn't play. Yeah, look, they, they might want to be in Detroit because it won't rain. Apparently, if it rains, th th this guy's got problems. I agree with you on everything you said with Shanahan. This is four out of five years getting to the conference championship game. At some point, you got to punch the ticket, uh, kick, kick the door down. And look, in a weird way, like if Purdy goes out and they lose and it's raining and dude can't complete a pass and he lays an egg, you'd almost have to think that there would be conversations about, do we have the right guy? I mean, is this, is he just a, I mean, look, we're going from, is he the next Tom Brady to this guy be on the bears next year? This, I, I think it's weird that the guy was an MVP candidate and we thought it, we're, we had the most confidence in him, but if he does not play well, either this Sunday or in the Super Bowl or just looks bad, I could see him having a conversation of, you know, this guy was the last pick in the draft for a reason. Maybe we've gotten everything we could out of him and we look to go in a different direction. So I think I think this is really, really important for Brock Purdy and Mike Shanahan. Listen, I've been, called, I've been called a front runner before. I'll start cheering for the guy that looks good and start bashing the guy that doesn't. It's totally fine. Brock Purdy doesn't know me yet. Yet. The most powerful yet. word in the English language yet. Exactly. And look, the flat bill, which I know you love. All right. So look, uh, let's let's look ahead here. Kansas City versus Baltimore, Detroit versus San Francisco. W which one are you looking forward to the most? Uh, well, the Chiefs and the Ravens, you know, it's Mahomes versus Lamar. But the Lions and 49ers is more kind of rags versus riches. It very much seems, I mean, how different can those cities be? How different can their head coaches be? I, I That's kind of you know, stereotyping Shanahan being um, a little bit prettier than than Dan Campbell. He's NFL. I mean, his dad was a coach. I mean, he's, you know, that, that kind of thing. It's kind of the yep. coaching prodigy. But it's Mahomes thing. and Lamar. And I'll be, you know, I've, I have, I've found myself not knowing who to root for. I don't, we don't have a dog in the hunt. I'll be, I will be cheering and rooting for Mahomes and the Chiefs. And I will be rooting for, um, the Detroit Lions and and Jared Goff and Dan Campbell, but looking forward to that Chiefs Ravens game. And Same. I think, yeah, I think the I think the Ravens are are the better team. Um, obviously, the line says they are. The 49ers are the better team. The the line says they are. But I would imagine this be a very very close game. You know, perhaps we can tell who's going to win based on the best movie or TV show that was set in each one of these cities. Now they're not great what I would call quote unquote movie cities. I have not been a good, a good look at that, but let's just kind of pick our favorites, Bob, of the best TV show and or movie that has been set in each of the final four cities. Let's start with, uh, let's go with the early game. Let's start in Kansas city. It's a tough one, but what, what do you got there? It's a tough one, but I've got, if you remember in the TV show Ozark, the main kingpin was in Kansas city. Um, and then he was taken out, son, son took over. It's a stretch, it's a reach, but when you try to research movies set in Kansas City, for whatever reason, they just don't love the heart of America. Not a lot of movies set there. So I'll go with an outlier of the Ozark Kingpin. Very good, yeah. I had that written down, a little bit of a reach, but we'll, we'll allow it. Look, special uh, note, honorable mention, Wizard of Oz. It's in Kansas, but I don't really know, know where. But I went with Looper. <laughs> You have not seen Looper. This is Bruce Willis and Joseph Gordon-Levitt, a.k.a. Robin from Batman. It's great. It's got time travel involved. Joseph Gordon, am I saying it right? Joseph Gordon-Levitt is yeah. playing like a younger version of Bruce. The, the, the weirdest part of the movie is just they've contorted <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt's face to try to look like Bruce Willis. It's very odd, a little discerning. It's got Emily Blunt in it. It's really cool. I mean, you get time travel. Look, it starts messing with your head and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, have you seen Looper? Are you a fan of that? Mark, I have. And, you know, as, as, as movie podcasters as we are, we need to be a little bit more conservative with how we dole out compliments. I think you said this movie was great. Looper? Love it. Great. Love Looper. Okay. All right. <laughs> I wouldn't all right. right. Kansas City is playing Baltimore. I What'd don't think, them? yeah, I think it's The Wire. I don't know if, yeah, I think it's The Wire. I don't even know if there's anything. I, I didn't even research it because it's 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 The Wire. Yeah, it's the quintessential Baltimore show. The We Own the Night, the Wayne Jenkins follow-up to The Wire. Did you see that? That's, that is really good. 
the oh not we own the night is are you sure you're saying that right we own the city is it we own the city what is it we own the night is the movie that our main man jay fresh he loves uh, that. that's yeah, with that's joaquin, uh... joaquin phoenix it's a object objectionally objectively bad movie and and our man jay fresh 20 years ago called us both and said you got to see this movie we watched it and every time we talk to jay fresh we remind him that he cannot be on our movie podcast because he vouched for We Own the Night. I forget what the name of the movie. The, I think it's We Own the City. Anyway, it's Wayne Jenkins. It's, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. All right, on to the NFC matchup. Detroit v. San Francisco. So Detroit, a lot of good to choose from here, I think. What'd you go with? Well, I mean, this guy's all over. You got to go eight mile, right? You have to go eight mile. It's M. Uh, I don't know how he's not. he didn't perform or sing the national anthem or whatever. I guess he doesn't do that much anymore. But you got to go eight mile. Yeah, this is Eminem is having himself a day. Kid Rock not getting any luck. I guess Eminem kind of stole his thunder mm -hmm. on this deal. For Detroit movie, I'm going Gross Point Blank. Now, I've actually been to Gross Point. It's a suburb of Detroit. This is a great John Cusack mini driver. Mini driver. I forgot about that. Goodwill yeah. Hunting mini, mini, mini driver in there. Uh, fun fun movie uh, in Gross Point Blank. I've, I've, uh, I've been there. Finally, San Francisco. What'd you got? With? I've got the I've got the winner, and it may affect my Super Bowl pick. You go first because this is different than the one that I we talked a little bit about this. But you oh, are going to okay. totally agree with me. Go ahead. All what's, right. What's so this this is a shot. This is a shout out to the old man. Our old man didn't didn't love. He just couldn't sit through a movie. Just really struggled with the time frame, uh, the commitment to doing it. But other than the Chicago Bears, he might not have loved anything more than Harry. Dirty Harry Callahan. He he loved, do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? So I'm going with Dirty Harry, set in San Francisco way back when. A shout out to Tom Pazotic, one of his all-timers. Well, so now we have to pick San Francisco because that's amazing. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to you one of the most underrated comedies of all time. We're in the blender. Oh, that is <laughs> good. The internship with Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn is an absolute masterpiece. Mm. It will get a pause award here soon, and the pause will go to the internship. It is an awesome, awesome movie. And I, and with that, I win this competition. So good job by <laughs> good job by me. Good, good job by you. Yeah, that's a good poll. That is that, look Owen, uh, Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn in anything is 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 pretty strong. Speaking of that topic, if we pivot away from the NFL. You watching anything? You got any streaming recommendations for the uh, the crowd at home here? You know, we talked about this, and I'm glad we're having this section because I'm not watching anything. So I'm going to just sit back. I'm going to be a fan. I'm going to turn up the volume, and I'm going to listen to your suggestions here. Oh, very nice. Well, I've got two. So the first is it's it's out. We're two episodes in. It's True Detective on HBO. Now, look, I think we're on the 10-year anniversary of the initial season of True Detective Matthew McConaughey, Woody Harrelson, one of the great seasons in television history. Look, this is a little sneak preview. I think Bob and I are going to have a March Madness style bracket of the greatest TV shows of all time. This is my early pitch for True Detective season one to get in there. Look, it's not an overall number one seed, but this is a, you know, this is like a, a, a game four or five seed probably. In my fun, opinion. Like, that's yeah. a lot. Of, that's a lot of fun. It's on HBO. It kind of mixes. It's set in Alaska, so it's dark, you know, just constantly, which is kind of a cool thing, kind of a little supernatural to it. Look, we're only two episodes in, but I am watching that. But more importantly, Bob, this Friday, January 6th, you're probably going to have to renew your Apple TV subscription. I know you got rid of that after Ted Lasso. I Ted did. Lasso, Ted Lasso, I, Ted Lasso uh, did. went off. But January 6th, Friday, Masters of Air. Now, this is the, the follow-up, same people, Spielberg, Hanks, Band of Brothers, which – you know, come on, not enough you could say about that. The Pacific, it's follow up, not as great, but still good. So, look, if Masters of Air can sniff somewhere near Band of Brothers, this will be fantastic. So, I'm excited about that. So, look, those are two things for you to, to check out, but get your Apple TV subscription back, back up and running. Any chance you're going to watch Masters of Air? Uh, uh, yeah, I want to. Like, you know, it's a. Uh... With it's well, I, I'm 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 very very hesitant to mention 
you know, kids and family, because last time I did, we got some fan mail that just ripped me up and down saying not to mention the fact that I'm a dad anymore. So, and I still need that. I need that feedback. We need to do fan, uh, wow. fan feedback. We've got to do that. Um, but yes, I'm going to, it's, uh, it's coach. It's hard. I mean, you know, it's a lot of stuff going on. Baseball starting up here, which leads to the speaking, next. Speaking of look last week in the Bob's beef segment, Woo. You touched yeah. a nerve on capitalism. We We're going to see where you go this week, Bob. Do you have a beef? If so, what is it? I do. And if the, and you know if the thir- if if the third rail is is banging on capitalism, the fourth rail might be banging on your son. Um, you know. So first, let me clarify my take on capitalism. All and I said this in the text string to all our listeners here. I'm not saying ca- listen. Ca- Without capitalism, the world doesn't run. I totally understand that. Listen, I, for my actual job that actually pays me money, I've got to keep an eye on the market. So I know capitalism works. I'm just trying to motivate maybe one of our listeners to be a tad more generous. That's all. That's all. That's it. Whether you make 40000 or $40 million, we all could be a little bit more generous. That's all that was. was. But, you know, I can take it. I'm a tough guy. Fair enough. So, yeah, my beef is with my nine-year-old son. And, I, you know, he's not old enough to listen to this, I don't think, even though we're a clean podcast, we don't do any nonsense, which I'm proud of. So we're starting with baseball. And what I'm trying to teach this dude, and maybe you struggled with it, I don't really care if he's good at baseball. I don't really care if he's good at any sports or anything. He's got to, he's got to work hard at school. I just need to teach him how to be great at something. Now, his sister is a grinder. Right? His sister is an absolute grinder. I got no worries with her. I don't know what the opposite of a grinder is, but that's Sam. He's not a grinder. He's uh, he's not a grinder. I think if we practiced baseball every day for the next five months, he'd be totally fine with it. And if we never played baseball ever again, he'd be totally fine with that too. <laughs> it's not even motivation. He's not lazy. He's just, he can't really get all that focused on it. Um, He's a good little athlete. He's got good hand eye, but I don't want to be the dad that says, Hey, you got to go practice five hours of pitching. Cause you got to be good at baseball. Cause it makes me feel cool at the ball field. I'm trying to teach him how to be good at something. And I just don't know if he cares to be good at anything right now. Um, <laughs> so that's my beef. That's my beef. And trying to articulate that to a nine-year-old uh, can be a challenge at sometimes, as you know, that, that, that is a chat. So season, when, did, when do we kick off this season? We've missed three practices, two because of weather, one because of rain. We're supposed to practice here in a couple of days and it's supposed to rain again. So um, we'll, we'll see, but he's playing, he's playing travel baseball, rec baseball is not what any of you on this call. Remember uh, any of this, sh- anybody listening, remember is it's, it's not good. So we've got to do the travel thing and we'll see. Mm-hmm. It's fun. It's a, it might be my last year coaching them. They, you kind of you kind of age out of dad coaching sooner than you did back. So what in the day. what is your role? Are you the third base coach, first base coach? What, 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 what I am the do? assistant. I'll probably be on the first base side in charge of infield. Um, I cannot coach hitting. I've I've messed him up pretty good hitting. Uh, we got him. We we got him some lessons in back in line, but I I cannot teach hitting. I don't know how. I don't know why, but I don't know how to teach it. All right. Well, look, we're looking forward to what team are we this year? What, uh, what's 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 the next? We're the D backs. D backs. Yeah, All right. Very good. Well, yeah. Good luck to the D backs. Good luck to Sam. We'll get some updates. Maybe see what see what he's hitting. We for uh, sure throughout the year. Well, look, this has been fun. Uh, final uh, thoughts here. Uh, your prediction: Who is going to make it to the Super Bowl, Bob? What do you got? I'm going to say Mahomes and Niners. It's going to be Chiefs Niners. I can't go against Mahomes. We'll say Chief Niners, and then we'll do a preview of all the. Uh, Super Bowl and prop bets. I want to do a lot of. Uh, I want to do a lot of prop bets. That'll be that'll be kind of a fun segment. But I'll say Mahomes and Purdy meet in the Super Bowl. All right. I'll just just to be different. I'll go the two one seeds. Baltimore, San Fran. We get the month of Harbaugh continuing. See what goes on. Look, Bobby. Good to see you. If you enjoy this podcast and any of the material that we talk about, usually the NFL or sports once a week, we've got another Hall of Fame movie edition coming up this Thursday. We tease that out a little bit. Bob, I don't know if you got another quote you want to do to tease, but look, head over to Spotify. Give us a follow. Let us know what you think. You can also find us on Twitter at at the podcast. There's some interesting material coming out of there. Any other teasers for the movie that's coming out this week, Bob? You said he still got it, which was a great one. Anything else? 
Yeah, it's the hangover. Um, <laughs> we're, we've got creative differences. I think we should release the name of it. Mark likes to tease it. Um, my hint is it's the hangover. <laughs> it's the hangover. It, it is the hangover. I watched <laughs> it again for the 400th time yesterday. It's still just as good as the first. That's coming up on Thursday. Bobby, this has been the podcast. Talk to See you guys. Like-